So when I was a uh, conservation student, um, one of the absolute worst animals that you could possibly uh, get in your exam paper or the, the practical sort of part of your exam, it had to do with uh, sort of dis dissections, right? Like you had to know the animal and then dissect it and all of that sort of stuff. Um, every single person in my class they were absolutely petrified to stick their hand into a container and pull out a slip of paper with the phylum that they were going to have to dissect, right? The representative animal of that particular phylum. And that animal was none other than <laughs> something so basic. The snail, garden snail. If any of you are watching out there, I'm sure you guys remember because, yeah, this was not a fun animal to dissect in a silent classroom. Uh, yeah, anyways, point, point being, today's episode is about snails. Snails, snails, snails. Some people call them escargot. A lot of gardeners absolutely loathe them. Uh, and in the horticultural industry as well, uh, you know, so much money has been put into the management of snails and, and, you know, just getting rid of them. So, today's episode is exactly about that. And this here is our snail, the African snail, well, one of. And it also happens to be one of the world's largest land snails, or the largest land snail in the world and it's called Akatina. So this here, if I just show you this for size, <laughs> behold, Woo. right? That is insane. This snail can reach about 15 centimeters. Okay, when it's foot's out, which is a whole lot of inches because I work with a metric system. I'll put it up on screen for you. Anyways, let's get into snails. So today I decided to come to the beach to show you some examples of the types of sna snails, in inverted commas, or the family mollusca to which snails belong. And uh, just to show you some of the diversity that we have on our coastline here on the Southern Cape Coast of South Africa, or South Africa really. Let's start there and we can work our way back to the garden. Right. So the class by Valvia includes true oysters, mussels, scallops and the like. They are very well known and very well represented because they make amazing seafood dishes. These are brown mussels and there are some blue mussels in this colony over here as well. The blue mussel is a European introduced species to the coast of Africa. So when you're out there collecting mussels, Go for the blue one, not the brown one, because the brown one is ours and they often get displaced by the more prolific blue mussel, uh, which then takes up all of the space on the rocks and puts our own brown mussel in danger. So if you didn't know this, I hope this is useful. There you go. I'm sure you've seen this before, right? This is cattle bone or cuttlefish bone which is basically the uh, internal part of a cuttlefish which is a relative of the octopus or squid. Now a lot of people use this because it contains some really good nutrients uh, for birds and you'll often find this in bird cages. So this essentially is part of the snail family. And the winkles are also snails. I'm gonna let this guy go now. You can see the foot right there.
So let's put him back where I found him. So these are plow snails and or plow shells as some people call them. You can see how they are feeding off of this jellyfish and really they're located using this siphon like device that they've got on the front of their of their shells and their heads um, and they basically just search in the form of water that washes up on the on the shoreline and they can actually pick up the chemical trails of prey items and food items in the in the water and then they follow and this is where they they then jostle for positions for the best meal so to speak they are direct family of the garden snail only a seagoing version that eats meat Here's an octopus which I found which belongs to the class Cephalopoda and uh, they are probably some of the smartest quote unquote snails in the world. So cephalopods include the cuttlefish, uh, the octopus and also squid among others. So yeah. This octopus I found uh, hunting crab and, uh, and then just sort of luckily I, I kind of just stayed quiet so that people didn't catch it because they were trying to hunt uh, for octopus on, on the beach uh, which I don't, I don't really to be honest as long as it's feeding your family I really don't have an issue with that because people need to eat like human beings need to eat and you may, you may or may not like that but you know each to their own as long as you're not decimating populations and hurting animals unnecessarily then you know uh, I did though keep quiet and and try to keep it safe so I'll have you know that this octopus went off into the oncoming high tide in, in safety so yeah alrighty I did film a lot of this episode at night and the reason why is because a lot of them are nocturnal and they want moisture and cool temperatures and things to actually forage around and and you know do their thing so yeah so I've been trying to film this uh, for a while now and uh, I was actually looking for an Acantina snail which is the largest land snail in the world which is native to Africa um, and this these guys I find them every so often you find them just kind of like especially with when the weather's like this um, they come out and uh, feast and here they're eating some strawberries or and now look at the regular garden snail you can see right next to it how big this um, a cantina actually is a uh, very beautiful thing they don't often eat uh, garden variety plants, sort of your ornamentals. So this is actually a first time for me to see this as well. Um, so it's great that I get to share this with you. Uh, and there's a little cricket down there as well, having chowing down on some strawberries and a snail. I think the snail has had enough. What exactly are snails? So, snails belong to a family that is so large it can be divided into seven different classes. And those classes are Aplacophora, Monoplacophora, Polyplacophora, Bivalvia, Gastropoda, and Cephalopoda. And then lastly, of course, Scaphopoda. The one we're focused on and interested in is Gastropoda because this class includes the creature that we're actually dealing with. So that would be snails as well as slugs. So shelled or not shelled, uh, de-shelled. Um, 
this is the class of of snails and so basically the word gastropod or gastropoda actually <laughs> means stomach foot <laughs> because <laughs> i find that so funny but yeah stomach foot right because uh their stomachs sit right above one major foot so if you can imagine that in human terms that would be a really creepy looking person <laughs> I digress. So, snails. They're basically found absolutely everywhere. They are found in freshwater systems, saltwater systems, i.e. the ocean, and uh, also estuaries and sort of saline systems, which is basically uh, sort of salty and fresh. Um, and, and also on land, of course, in tropical rainforests, deserts, um, cold freezing places, savannah, warm, just every possible ecotone, ecosystem you can think of, snails can be found there. So, they're a big family. Where exactly does one, I mean, where do they hang out? Like, when we don't see them, where do snails hang out? Snails hang out on plants. They hang out inside plants, such as bromeliads, so you can see in there, right? They also hang out inside pots and things like that, like garden equipment. You'll find them hanging out under bits of wood and logs, um, tree stumps. And they also like to hang out in places like this, hothouses shade houses in between the pots in between the bags and the trees and the plants um, they'll just hang out in between those things and then also they really love plants obviously because this is what they eat and destroy um, so some of the plants that they do really love uh, are plants such as clivias agapanthus strobilanthus bromeliads orchids ferns lilies and so many other plants uh, especially herbaceous plants that have nice soft florally parts like flowers and fruits and things like that they really adore those kinds of uh, plants uh, because obviously it provides them with a form of sustenance in one way or another right so here are seven facts that you may or may not have known about snails Okay, so fact number one, snails are actually hermaphrodites. And what this means is basically that you don't really have a male or a female snail. Snails are both male and female at the same time, which is bizarre, right? It's strange. They can both receive sperm. They can both lay eggs, which makes them kind of really, mm, like... I don't need a man kind of thing, you know, <laughs> you know? Um, yes, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Fact number two, they're the largest group of animals second only to insects with respect to diversity. So there are literally 85,000 different species of mollusks which basically includes the gastropods and, you know, the octopus and all of the happy hole family. That is crazy number. That is a, an insane amount of life forms. And the diversity is just absolutely insane. I mean, they are even hairy snails. Yeah, snails covered in fur. Go check it out. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave a link in the description on that. Fact number three. In... American Indian culture, snails represent happiness and the shape of the shell, you know, the spiral on the back of the shell, as you see here, uh, it basically represents the circle of life. And so it, it means happiness to, to this culture. And I think that that is both beautiful and fascinating. Fact number four. The world's smallest snail is so tiny 
that it can fit through the eye of a needle. I, go figure, I'm not even going to say anything more about that. I can't really picture that. So I tried finding pictures on it. Um, yeah, bizarre. The world's largest snail, on the other hand, is this guy. The Acantina. Uh, they are about 15 centimeters when uh, fully grown and fully emerged. Having a walkabout on their stomach foot. <laughs> Fact number five. Snails actually love the company of other snails, including slugs. So they actually hang out together and have meals together, like this. They'll actually spend a lot of time eating the same flower or the same fruit or just all kind of hanging out together on the same food source. Um, and I find that quite, quite, quite interesting. Um, I mean, if, if only snails could talk. Hmm. Am I beginning to really love snails? Yeah. Let's, let's wait and see. I think it's a bit, uh, that's a bit drastic and a bit early to tell. Fact number six. How long do you think a snail can live? Okay, so in the, in the wild, snails generally have been found to live for between three and seven years. But in captivity, a whopping... 25 years for an animal that tiny and it that just blow, blows my mind absolutely blows my mind 25 years that's a quarter of a century <laughs> yeah and fact number seven so when i was a kid and i can attest to this fact because uh i had a i suppose it like a wart, you know, like a sandy wart from playing in sand, or I don't know, that's what my mom told me anyways, uh, in, in the palm of my hand, and I used, someone told me, take a snail, agitate the snail until it foams, and put that foam on your skin, and I did this without question, and it disappeared, it went away, and I've since given this advice to other people, and they've done it, and it's gone away too, and so then you have products with things like saltone in it. And guess where saltone comes from? Good morning. So first and foremost, I've got a throat infection. So that explains why my voice is so hoarse today. Right, that's out of the way. Now, on the internet and in different books and magazines, there are a myriad of different resources containing copious amounts of information with which one can effectively manage snails. Okay, I'm only going to give you just the few that I feel I want to insert into this video um, and things that I'm familiar with, right, because obviously isn't that the point of a video? Sharing information is like not giving someone something that you don't know anything about. Okay, great. First and foremost, is prevention. Prevention is way better than cure, than having to now fix the damage caused by snails or having to manage the snails themselves. How do we prevent snails from entering the garden? Firstly, when you enter a nursery, uh, if you buy plants from anyone, you get plants from someone, a friend, a family member, or whatever, keep your plant in quarantine for a uh, uh, maybe a week or less actually it's not really that serious wet the plant and then when evening arrives go and check the plant see if there's anything that rises out of wherever the hidey holes are on that particular plant and then uh, manage your snails or slugs or whatever parasite it is that uh, that shows its face okay comes out for a feast that is that is like my number one tip um i did this in my the previous house that we lived at and i had absolutely no snails i can vouch for this method it really does work 
uh, if you're not in that position, you have been living in your home for X amount of time and you already now have this nail problem, or if you live in an urban environment and uh, this obviously implies that snails can migrate across fences and things and they'll constantly come into your property, well then unfortunately you're going to have to manage your snails manually, or oh, manually, you know, constantly, really, okay. I swear if I get interrupted one more time while I'm filming this, I'm going to absolutely lose my mind. Okay. Right. So my tip number one, uh, or, or management method number one, not tip, is the beer trap method. Now, I've just completed an episode on this. It will be released within the week. <clears throat> Sorry. Um... The beer trap method is something my mom's talked about for a really long time. She's read it in her plant magazines and, you know, sort of old wives' tale type of thing. And, uh, I, do I use it? I have used it. <clears throat> Excuse me, do I make, like, an, do I make, like, a, a concerted effort to use it? Eh, we'll see in the next episode. Right, I'll, I'll touch on that. But definitely, the beer trap method is a method that you can use. Um, pertaining to snails. Now, if you don't know what that is, I'll leave a link in the description for you to check that out. Right. Tip number two, or thingy number two. <laughs> okay, management method number two. Look, we've established that snails like hiding in specific places. Okay, so your management method in this respect could be to take empty pots be it clay pots, plastic pots, buckets, uh, little bits of log and wood and that sort of thing, and literally just leave them in strategic positions where you know snails hang out. And this would actually, when the weather's kind of like this, like rainy and overcast or whatever, sort of snail weather, you would find that the snails, as soon as the sun returns, the snails would go into hiding, right? And when they go into estivation, which is basically summer sleep, it's the, the, uh, the summer opposite of, of hibernation, um, you would find the snails actually going to hide out in these places. Now, this would be a really good way to actually get hold of your snails, to find the snails in your garden and then to effectively manage them. Right. Number three, you could also uh, introduce plant species that would in turn have flowers that draw certain kinds of insects and thereby certain kinds of birds. And those birds would be predatory on snails as well. Um, that could be a natural method. It is a bit of a long-winded method and if you live in an urban area uh, for example, in the UK or something like that, where, uh, or, or in a big city where you don't necessarily have all of the wildlife um, that people would have in places, in wild places, then this, this, this method won't work for you. And also, it, it takes a bit of understanding about ecology and all of that in your specific area in order to execute this method. Number four is my favorite one, and this is the method that I personally use all the time. Uh, it is a bit taxing, it is, it, it, it really does involve actually getting your hands dirty. And this is, what I do is, I wait until it rains, or the weather is really perfect for snails. I wait until evening, or I water my garden at late afternoon. I water my garden, I wait until it becomes dark, and I go out with a flashlight and a bucket, and I actually physically collect the snails. Okay, I wet the plants if I'm watering my garden myself, and I will go and physically collect the snails. And in this way, you will end up with a large majority of all of the snails and slugs present in your garden. Now, also know your snails, because some snails do eat, uh, they are predators, even the land-dwelling snails. Not all of them are uh, vegetarians, that's what I was looking for. 
Not all of them are vegetarians, and that said, know your animal before you just go and annihilate again, because that is just... That's why we end up in situations where we lose species, is because people just assume. Don't assume. Find out what you have, and then manage it in that way. Right. So that works for me amazingly well. And if you know of someone who has ducks or chickens, they love those kinds of things. <coughs> Excuse me, snails and, and, and the like. So you could very easily just gift that to the person who has snails and chickens, right? And then from there, you would get rid of your snails on a regular basis. Now, number five. Mm, number five has to do with salt. No. Number five is on the list. It does work. It really does work. But aside from it being a very messy method, and if you're a snail, I imagine a very painful method. Eh, yeah, guys, I'm not really going to advocate this. Also, it's very dangerous for your plants. So essentially what this is, is salt. Using salt to kill the snails or to, uh, yeah, deter them by laying little bits of salt trails and things around or sprinkling salt over the snails. I'm not really a fan of this because salt will alter the chemical nature of your soil and in times gone by, the worst thing you can do to someone's garden if you want to destroy it is to scatter copious amounts of salt because if you look at the ocean, how many plants are you finding on the beach? Or very, very few plants, as they say in South Africa, which means very little. Right, so you don't want to use salt. You can, like I'm throwing my hands up, okay, at that method, but it does work. But be careful, because you could also harm your plants, and the damage can be very long-lasting with salt and can be expensive to fix. Okay, right. Method number six is coffee grounds. Now, snails and slugs, it is said that they don't like caffeine. Um, you can use coffee grounds not used coffee grounds, unused coffee grounds. This means you would actually be wasting coffee for your slugs. Eh, and your snails. Also, not my favorite, but this one I haven't actually tried. I have seen snails eat coffee grounds before, so I'm a bit like, eh, I don't really think that that works. However, caffeine, uh, caffeine, they don't like caffeine. They, I've poured some uh, some cool coffee onto a snail and it didn't like that but then hey if you get flooded with any kind of liquid that you don't know what it is would you also not be going like don't shower me with that what's wrong with you you know yeah so that's method number six and the last one which is number seven is to use diatomaceous earth now diatomaceous earth is basically a powder powdery substance it's basically ground up sedimentary rock and long story short comes from a creature called diatoms as well as some other um oceanic creatures uh, especially i don't want to say prehistoric um but like dead for a long time and they basically grind them up and it it is basically 80 to 90 percent silica now silica again as i've mentioned in previous uh, growing medium episodes uh, perlite uh, and also silica sand to inhale that stuff is not good for you diatomaceous earth same thing you don't want to inhale it but diatomaceous earth is an inert substance it is amazing for a lot of different things um, and I have tried this and it does work. It even works for ants, but it's expensive if you think about uh, the size of an ant colony and Yeah, just having to like manage all of that with like diatomaceous earth is mm, it's not good. So It does work. It really does work Is it practical? Mm, 
yeah, that remains to be seen. So, that, that, uh, those are my seven, uh, seven methods. What I will say is, to close off this episode is, your best method is, number one, is prevention is better than cure. And number two, for me, is to actually wet your garden, put out hidey holes for them, you know, little snail casinos or snail little hangout spots and for them to go and like hang out in there and then to collect them from that point on uh, the uh, the alternative is obviously to wet your garden and wait for them to come out and then to physically go and collect them uh, depending on your situation this may be useful or not useful I don't know you'd be able you'd, you'd be able to answer that question so that is essentially my seven tips on snail management, seven methods of snail management, as well as uh, my singular tip, which is prevention is better than cure. Okay, so guys, I hope that this was informative, useful, and that you will now be able to go out there and effectively manage your snail problem. Okay, so... Uh, Stay tuned for the next episode, which deals with the beer trap, ep uh, beer trap method, and we'll do a bit of a myth bust on that one. So, um, it's really awesome weather, and I would like to say to you all, enjoy wherever it is that you are in the world, make good choices, you know, just love life, and be safe, wear your mask, uh, whether or not you believe in it. Um, yeah, okay, I'm not even going to deal with that stuff. Have a good one, and I will catch you in the next episode. Lots of love, and thanks for watching. Bye for now.